here we are again. What's happening? And this is second episode of the Slap Stream live from Slapsville. And I cannot thank you enough, like for how many people saw it. Like over a thousand people saw the first episode with Kevin Smith. Super excited about it. I always thought Slap Bass was something that you know only really specific people want to like it, kind of like weirdos. And I'm glad there are like so many slappers or weirdos, whatever you want to call us, out there. And today's guest is another one of my favorites, like really one of my favorite uh, slap bass players, uh, especially for early jazz. And you notice that I titled this video Early Jazz, Early Jazz Slap Bass with Ryan Gold. Before I introduce Ryan, I would like to mention that my band, Tiger Army, uh, just re released um, a new video. And it's, let me see how I can do this. Um, we released, OK, I'm not sure how, how I can do it. I just switched to Firefox. I had some problems with, with um, Chrome. So maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I actually, I'll, I'll try. Um, so you might be, you know what, like, forget about it. Like, just go to Rise Records and check out, uh, check out, um, check out your, uh, uh, check out our latest video. It's for the song Last Ride. I think it turned out pretty good. There's like lots of hot rods, lots of um, lots of cool people. We had a blast. It kind of all seems like a like a dream right now because we cannot do any of that. Uh, first of all, I see there's like a decent amount of people out here already. Thanks a lot for that. I uh, just want to make sure that you hear me. So please write that in these comments in the live chat. Just want to make sure that everything sounds good, looks good. More concerned about the sound than the look. So please, someone write something. Um, all right, I'll assume, I will assume that everything is fine. Um, all right, so next guest. Uh, the star of the second slap stream. I believe that he was the main featured guy like on the Art of Slap Bass as well uh, on the website on the second episode as well. It's Ryan Gold. Ryan Gold. And um, he's, by my opinion, one of, one of the best, one of the best experts on early jazz. Uh, I met Ryan... I believe it was on a tour with Fish Tank Ensemble, my old band. When I toured Austin, I made sure like to 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 meet with Ryan and we talked, you know, I don't know, for hours. You know, we jammed at his place. I believe I stayed at his place for a week or something. So we were able to share each other's uh, licks and and just like to talk slap. You know, that's the main thing that that that. Uh, that's how that's where our uh, that's what our passion is um and he's really one of rare guys that i can talk about all those kind of things like like bill johnson and steve brown did bill johnson break his bow did it, is that how the slap started or all kinds of pops foster things and so like wh whatever you know from that spe specifically for that era from the um, uh 10s 20s 30s I think that's where his expertise lies. And we, um, we're going to ask him that. So if you guys have any questions, just write it down on the side. And I would really appreciate you all subscribing to, to the channel if you have not. I think that a subscribe button is somewhere around here, here, here. So click on that one, subscribe, and share this video. We made this one public. So I would like as many people as possible to uh, to hear what main slap bass experts have to say. 
So please do that and share the video. I'll also like to uh, thank to all the people that donated. I put like a, a few links uh, below how you can support us. Uh, the best way is Patreon. The link is under and, but there's also donation buttons under that. So if you feel that you want to support slap base and help it survive, do it. Um, all right. Without further ado, I'm really excited, really, really excited to, to be able to talk to Ryan. We do that fairly often, but this is the first time that we are making actually public. So you can all hear all these things that we are talking about. You might be crazy people, but you might be crazy as well. So you might enjoy this. Um, after this, I want you to check his uh, interview with uh, with the Artist Lab Base uh, on the Artist Lab Base website. It's, as I said, I think it's the, the second one. So let's add one of the busiest musicians from Austin, Texas, Ryan Gould. Hey, Ryan. Hey. What's happening? Uh, you know it. I don't know if I'm the busiest, uh, the busiest slap bassist in Austin right now. Well, none of us, none <laughs> of us is busy. But I remember, you know, when when I met you, or when I heard about you, like you know, I I, I, th I believe that that's right when I moved to US, and I was checking out my schedule. I was like, all right, cool. I have like four gigs this month, and then I check checked out your MySpace. I think your MySpace oh, wow. or like this guy's plays like two gigs every day for next four months or something. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> so I remember that at least you used to be one of the busiest uh, slap bass players and I believe musicians in Austin because nobody can play that often. So how are things nowadays? Any gigs? Uh, just this one. I just show <laughs> up on, on virtual hangs and talk nonsense about bass. Yeah, no, I've, I have nothing, do. nothing on the books. Uh, I think the last thing I had, a, I had a festival in, in September in, uh, in Canada, and that was the last one that got canceled and nothing for the foreseeable, as they say. Yeah, my, my dates in, got canceled until September. We're still keeping hope and that we're going to be able to do the dates in October. Who knows? That's like a couple cool festivals that uh, I'm supposed to play with Tiger Army. It's Nashville Boogie in Nashville and and our October Flame. So you know, fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Always. But until then, we can do you know this. So you know, it seems that people enjoyed it. So that's great. First of all, I would like to ask you, how did you start? How did you start playing bass? And um, if you remember, do you remember the first lick that you learned? <laughs> uh, well, I'll answer the easy question about how I started first. Um, I was already playing guitar. Uh, I was playing guitar in a death metal band in high school and some punk rock things. Um, then I went off and joined the Marines because that's what you do when you're a death metal musician and and you lose your art your, your scholarship to art school. Um, so, uh, hey, Kevin. Uh, the uh, sorry, I'm reading comments too. Uh, I went off uh, to the Marines and somehow really got invested in Irish music. Um, when I came home, uh, the the exploration of Irish music really got me into more traditional musics, and uh, so I. I in the midst of the Irish music, I picked up Irish pipes, which is even crazier than slap bass. And uh, I don't recommend doing it unless you're double the crazy you need to be to slap. Um, so got into that traditional stuff. And my cousin, who was my my guitar teacher, uh, my first big musical influence, in fact, um, he had a bluegrass band. He was playing guitar and uh, they had a mandolin player and a banjo player. and uh, I think it was an Easter family gathering or something. And, uh, you know, we we're, you know, 
kind of the black sheep of the family and always tried to run and hide and listen to some music or just talk about weird artsy things. Um, we uh, were hanging out in his car and he had a demo of the band. And I thought, man, all, you know, all this thing needs is, is, a uh, is a bass and it would sound perfect, you know? Um, and I, I, at the time I was, I was also considering, uh, playing trombone. I was listening to a lot of ska too, but trombone and double bass sounded really interesting to me in that music. Um, so he, he knew that and he said, do you want to play, uh, if, if I get you a bass, will you promise to play it in the band? And I said, sure, I, I will learn it super quick. And, and uh, he brought me an electric bass guitar, which I thought was cheating. Luckily or unluckily, I had a I had a job that I was working for 60 hours a week at that point. So I had money coming out of my ears and no time to spend it. So I went straight to the uh, straight to the, the music store. The, the only one in the area that I knew had a bass sitting in the corner. I think I spent. 800, 900 bucks on it. It was a really cheap. Uh, I don't even remember what it was anymore. It was just some cheap thing. Uh, bought that thing, brought it home and started figuring out what it was all about. Started playing a bunch of two beat stuff. Um, and then joined that band and did a lot of rehearsing. Um, started playing gigs and that band wasn't necessarily a traditional bluegrass band it was it was i'd call it like a punk rock or, or a punk bluegrass band um so everything we were doing was super frenetic and uh, high energy um it was loads of fun and that's that's where all the bass started oh wow. and do you remember what was the first lick that you played i sure don't <laughs> Some how did beat. you say that? Uh, how did Milt, Milt Hinton called one five uh, rocking chair or something? Rocking chair, yeah, yeah, that was, sure, was like, chair. Yeah, have you guys like heard like you know about that term? I heard it for the first time last time uh, uh, yesterday from Ryan. He said like, oh, you know, rocking chair. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so, like, like he said like, oh, Milt Hinton was talking about it, and that's that's how they I guess used to call it that baseline when one five one five right. Yeah, there's a uh, one of one of those Milton Hinton videos that's on uh, on YouTube. Uh, he's he just gives a really, really it's it's a quick interview. It looks like he's in his basement or something. And uh, he just talks about how, you know, some some guys while they're solo and want you to do this and some guys want you to do that. And and he you know, he he kind of like vocalizes the, the the line he's talking about. You know, he's like some guys want to scale up and down. And then he says, some guys want a rocking chair, you know, boom, 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 boom. It's great. That's cool. I have to yeah. check out that video. Um, so do you remember what were your influences back then? And I would like to like start with talking about like your influences now, like and what helped you actually, how did you develop your own style? I mean, you, when I hear you playing, I immediately know that's you, you know, I know um lots of people nowadays i mean comparable to before play old school jazz now and but i think that i can recognize your tone and your sound uh pretty quickly so what how did you develop your style how they develop your style what what was the reason that you play the way you do uh right now who were the influences like what inspired you a lot of that um, as far as developing my own style, uh, well, I, I guess the, the first inspirations I, I heard were, were Kevin, Kevin Smith. Um, I, I heard him on, on a, on a Spank, the first Spankers record. And, uh, I think Jimmy Dean was the, the, the drummer and just playing snare. And I thought, I thought that I thought, man, that drummer and bass player, they really have their act worked out. Like everything's just like they really spent some time. And uh, and then at some point, my cousin, the the guitar player that taught me, uh, he and I were both geeking out over that and then realized, wait, 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 that's that's just the bass player. Um, 
Yeah, it was all over from there. Thanks, Kevin. So were you were you in Austin back then, or? No, I was I was outside of Philly. Oh, okay. Um, have you ever s seen Kevin playing at that at that time? No, no, I hadn't gotten to see Kevin play live. Um, man, I don't know. It was. I do not remember the first time I got to see Kevin live. Um, it, it was probably a good year and a half after I got down here to Austin. So it was like 2001 ish. Oh, wow. Okay. It, it was a good, good long while before I got to hear him live. Well, or, I, I've seen Kevin play playing only with Willie Nelson. So that has to be like, you know, like, like last few years, you know, I never seen him and I would like like to, to, to see him actually like, you know, playing with somebody like high noon, that would be great. So Kevin, yeah. I know you're watching us. So do something high noon <laughs> US tour at least or California. So I can see you. Um, yes. Um, so uh, I think you have yeah, so Kevin, Kevin was the, uh, Kevin was the first big one. And then, uh, and I think I just stumbled somehow on Milt Hinton. This is all oh, before really? I came back. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I didn't know much of anything about him, but you know, like once you hear plucking the bass as a slap bass player, what are you going to do? You know, it's all over. Of course. Um, so it was not rockabilly at all, pretty much. Well, I had, so fair, fair play. Uh, I was listening to uh, that Spankers record, which, you know, covers a nice, you know, it's sure. kind of like slightly in some country, some in jazz, you know, some in blues. Um, Just like to mention, like, I'm not sure if uh, the audience is familiar with uh, with the band, Ryan is talking about Asylum Street Spankers. Yeah. Great band from Austin. They do not play uh, for a number of years now, but check out their records. Like quite a few great slap bass players play with them yeah. over the yeah. years. So, yeah. sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. Oh, you're grand. Um, yeah, so I was also listening to the stuff that uh, Kevin did with Wayne Hancock. Um, so that sunk me into that. Uh, sunk me into a little bit more country music. Um, and I did, what did I got? Uh, I did pick up uh, a high noon record, the the live one, uh, live from Austin and Japan. I, I can't remember exactly what the title was. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah, that one. Orange I cover, a, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a friend of mine stole the record. So thanks. Um, but I remembered it very well um and stole a whole bunch of kevin stuff so thanks again um but yeah kevin kevin and milton hinton were the first big ones um but so i, I learned a bunch of kevin licks um and then felt like i could never like i just was wasn't in a place to learn milton hinton stuff at all I, how was i going to do that i didn't know nothing from nothing um so then uh I got hip to Django Reinhardt and uh, and Vola on all those early recordings is just doing two beat stuff. And it was so accessible. Um, so that I think, you know, that Kevin and Milt Hinton for the the like strong emphasis on slap. Um, and the, the, the practice material with the, the Wayne Hancock and the and the Spanker stuff was, was so handy. And then when I found the Django stuff, that stuff, you know, like comparatively easy to, I think what most people, if they're just new to jazz, you know, they're not less, they're like I was at that point, I couldn't tell you what was going on at all with, you know, the harmony or like how to make a bass line. What am I doing? I don't know. Uh, so the Vola stuff, I was like, cool. It's just like bluegrass. It just has a different feel. And the, that feel was so amazing to me. It just like, it swung so hard and it was just two beat. Like it drives me crazy when, when a band leader says swing and they mean walk because I'm already playing two beat and I know it's swinging. Don't tell me it's not swinging, you know? And I, I you know, there's a lot of bass players that play two beat and they can't swing out of a wet paper bag. But, uh, um, I know like that's where I came from. I listening to 
to vola it's just like boom this is how a bass swings in too um so that that was a huge huge influence on me um and about then is when i moved to austin and as soon as i got down here i was i was in a band with two of the guys from spankers uh pops bayless and mysterious john we had a little ukulele band that was also it, it definitely had a, a punk rock feel to it. We weren't necessarily a punk rock band. I don't think any of us were thinking that, but it, it yes, had Spankers that. always had that kind of a little bit of a, of an edgy vibe. Yeah. And, I and always like, made sure I like to see, you know, they're, they're always great. You know, I, when, when I was living in San Francisco, they would usually come uh, through a place that was called 12 galaxies. The mission it was like one, one of my favorite places to go see shows. So as far as influences, you, so you would say, Kevin and and Milt Hinton. Would you choose anyone else? Vola, for sure. Louis Vola. Vola, okay. Um, and then, you know, that led to Pops Foster. You know, the more the more I got sunk into jazz, Pops Foster was the thing for me. Ah, okay. Um, and then uh, can and okay, so we, we can go like to the uh, recordings later on, like so you can mention that later. But yeah, you know, continue with the the influences. Um, yeah, so Pops Foster, and then, uh, like you're talking about my particular style. Um, I got a lot from Pops Foster because he's he makes his line, his his he builds his lines so melodically, it's not scalar. Um, there's a lot of counterpoint. Um, and maybe there's even more than I think there is because I've just superimposed that out of my own experience going, oh, I credit it all to Pops Foster, you know? Um, but there, there is enough in there that, you know, you can make an argument for it. At least I got some of it from him. Um, and then I was also listening to a lot, a lot of stride pianists and I love their left hands. They're so good and they have such interesting bass movement. And uh, like specifically Willie the Lion Smith, like he just, um, uh when you uh when you listen to him he's doing a lot of stutters and stalls and uh i know we've talked about it uh like one of the the things that you hear in my playing is you know like drop and beat one or oops two three four um and uh man that that stuff's all over his bass lines and i think that was a huge influence on me you know, a sad, like my, the very first music lessons I ever had were on a keyboard. And I think I had maybe like six, six weeks of it was, I, I think I had six lessons all together. And the, the teacher like just would randomly show up, you know, my, my folks or my, my, my granddad, my step granddad would, would drive me to the lesson and the guy wouldn't be there. And they got so upset with, with that guy that they pulled me out because they saw how I was disappointed but I always wanted to be a piano player. So it just never happened. Now I just stare at the piano going, oh, I'm just going to listen to Willie Lyon. He's such an amazing bass player. <laughs> so yeah, that, that, old I, stuff, that, that early big, slide stuff is great. Yeah, yeah. I'd, those, are, those are the big influences, at least at the start. You know, Bill Johnson came along and definitely reset a lot of stuff in my head. And for me too, like Bill Johnson always, that whole thing about him is that guy was something else. I mean, like yeah. he was a smuggler or something. And then he, he lived uh, like a hundred years. He was hundred years old or he might have not because different records show like a different dates. Uh, nobody's hundred percent sure when he, um, when he was born. They all know when he died. I, be, I believe it was 1972, if I remember yeah. correctly. And I actually, a few years ago, I, I tried to find his gravesite because he died in um, San Antonio, I believe. So I was like, all right, I have to pay respect, you know, like to, to all my favorite slap bass players, at least to the originators. And I was looking and I went to that gravesite that it's close to San Antonio. And... It's not marked. So I went like to the little um, little building over there, like when they keep the records. 
and Bill Johnson is there. Everything is there, but like he's like the only guy that's like no info. It's just like, and the guy that was living there, he's like, ah, my guess would be that he was, he was, he's buried here, but we don't know for sure. So, like, all right. Cool. At least I, you know, I did, you know, what I wanted to do. And that was kind of cool. I mean, it kind of adds to the mystery of that guy. If, if you guys are not familiar with Bill Johnson, he was like really one of the coolest guys for me, like as far as slappers. He played with Kidori and all those guys. But um, my favorite thing is when the, those re recordings that he did with, uh, with a priest, those are kind of like out there, like especially for the, 20s that's like 28 or something yeah those are great um, we you have a a couple of questions regarding uh milt hinton so uh, actually this is for me as well so kurt he said like have you seen milt hinton's video slab based tutorial a friend had it and showed it to me years ago i thought it was really good uh, i think it was through isb i, th I guess that's international society of bassists well, I know it is. So if you guys don't know, so I'm just mentioning yeah. that. Have you seen that one? Uh, is that the one? Uh, there was like a, a 3D, uh, three, three tape set. Yeah. Like Ray Brown was in it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 And I see that Josh Hogue says I still have his copy. Yeah. I was about I'll to look for it. Josh. Uh, I was about to put that one as well. I'm not sure if he's just want to remind you that his copy is with you or he wants to tell you that he's gonna he's driving to your house like right now to, to grab it be. or <laughs> he's coming to break another fan blade at my house yeah that's that's a, that's a actually a cool video and uh milt hinton actually did um i think like now on top of my head there's like two more times that he did kind of like instructional sled base video one is on maybe you you know more but this is like what comes to my mind right now one is um as a part of uh, chester zardis uh uh um, new orleans jazz man or something like that uh dvd or vhs so he did a little instructional dvd over there i believe that that one is on youtube as well so you guys mm. can check it out um and he did one more that's longer one but it's available this is this is kind of this is kind of crazy i found this one randomly when i was researching like milt, anything related to milt hinton and i noted that it noticed that in one library in um, uh, new york city i think it was library just for um um black american artists so so and milt hinton was there so 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 that, that just a vhs tape or like some kind of tape over there where he has like a full-on uh slab based lesson and mm. but you cannot you, you cannot rent it or anything you just have to go there and watch it so i did that a few times <laughs> when i went to new york on tour again like probably with deke dickerson or someone so i would go there and and then watch that and enjoy uh, watching Milt Hinton. It's he's he used to live in Queens, so you can. Yeah. I did that as well. Like drove by, like to see where, where the guy lived. Um, somebody took a lesson from him, like right? It was, was Adam. It? Adam Booker. Adam. Did. Adam, Adam yeah. Booker. Like I remember I mean, that he, he mentioned but, that. Yeah, I remember. Uh, I actually thought uh, Milt Hinton was dead. I don't know where I picked that information up. Oh. I thought he was dead. This is when I was still living uh, up outside of Philly. And uh, the Spankers had a gig, had two gigs in uh, in New York at the Mercury. And uh, uh, I went up for both of them. I mean, lived an hour and a half away. I wasn't going to miss it. Um, so I went up for the Saturday night one or whatever. I think it was a Saturday night. Um, was talking to someone else and Adam was right behind me and I just happened to overhear him saying I'm I'm gonna have a lesson tomorrow with Milton Hinton and I just I I was stunned and I turned around and just I'm sure I was probably 
extremely rude and just like interrupted the, the conversation went, I'm sorry, what did you just say? Um, I thought Milton Hinton was dead and, and Adam was like, yeah, sure enough. I'm, I got a lesson, blah, 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 you know? And I just thought, wow, that is, that is the coolest thing in the world. And then the next day, um, I went up there, uh, for the, the next show and, uh, whoever I was with a friend of mine, uh, we were, uh, I, I think it was actually Jeff Seaver that was up there. Jeff or uh, Shecky, the bass player from, uh, the Bell Furies now, uh, the two of us were up at the window getting a slice of pizza down the street from the Mercury and we looked down the street and, and Adam's walking up, just walking straight up the, the street. And the look on his face was the, I'll never forget the look on his face. He just seemed like he was in like bass player, like utopia. Like he just was like, well, he was, <laughs> Yeah, he, he, I know he was. <laughs> and he came up and, I don't think it had fully processed where, I mean, he obviously could tell you better than I could, but I remember him saying like, I don't even know what happened. Like, that was cool. I, I he said something about, uh, I think he said something along the lines of like, he had to help Milt get the bass up. But as soon as the bass went into his hands, it was like the guy was 20 years old again. And it just brought That's him up. back to life and, he said he said the hang was i think he said i don't want to i don't want to take his stories from him i'm sure you'll have him on the show he's such a great player but uh i remember him also saying something about he had to watch jeopardy with him before they could really get down to it so it's it's so cool have um, you tried to get a lesson with with milt have you tried no, I, at the time i just thought you know sadly you know some advice to anybody growing up right now, coming up right now. I feel so dumb. I, I, you know, there's very little regrets I have in life. One of them is that I thought I wasn't, I wasn't at a place where Milton Hinton would want to give me a lesson or I could get, you know, like his stuff was so far beyond my understanding, you know, as, as, as I understand it from every bass player I've ever talked to that, that talked to him was that, he was just the greatest guy on the planet and would give you the time. He would give you all the time he had if you were a bass player and were interested. It didn't matter what level you were at. So I kick myself for that all the time. I was up in New York at least once a week. The, I, at, the, at that point, I was uh, a delivery truck driver, you know, so I would I always had at least one delivery in New York City every every week. You know? oh, wow. So if I if I happen to get into Queens, I would, I, it's ridiculous, but I would just drive around Queens going, one day I'm going to see Milton and Mona just walking down the street and I'm going to jump yeah, out yeah. and, oh, bass player, adopt me. You know, <laughs> never happened. All right. So Mark Bass says, like, can you recommend some Pops Foster recordings? We're jumping a little bit, a little bit. Uh, yeah. back in the um, well, that How Low Can You Go box set is is a treasure for so many different things. And I think there's, I'm pretty sure Panama's on that from the Lewis Russell band. Um, Jersey Lightning is probably on it too. Those two are, as far as like earlier, uh, earlier Pops Foster stuff, like those two are so... Uh, so pops foster you know like the the drive and intensity of of you know like he shows you exactly where beats one two three and four are supposed to be um he, yeah he was great you know yeah. everybody, everybody should listen to pops foster yeah everybody there's also there, that great uh, book um what's called again that that book is called new orleans jazz man right his autobiography yeah it's uh yeah the autobiography of a New Orleans jazz man. And uh, actually, uh, that's the one. That's the first edition. That's the same one that I have. It's, it, Mark Rubin gave it to me. So thanks, Mark. Oh, really? I still have it. It's, it's barely holding together, but I still have it. They, they did a recent, well, recent, maybe like five or six years ago. Yeah, republic. yeah, they have a new one. Yeah. I would like, I'm sure that, you know, our audience would love to hear you play a little bit. So what are you going to play? What do you want to do? Uh, 
Well, we're talking about Pops Foster. So uh, I'll do. Uh, so as far as stuff that Pops Foster's on, like he's. For me, Pops Foster with Sidney Bechet is where it's at. Um, all the stuff he does with them, it's it's all small band stuff. And uh, like that's where Pops Foster shines to me. Um, well, he shines everywhere to me, but the small band stuff is amazing. Um, and Bechet is, you know, you want to talk about another massive influence in my life. You know, Bechet and Pops, there's, you know, the photos that I have on my walls in my house are Pops Foster and Sidney Bechet. Um, there's a, this just lives on the music stand, you know? All right. That's the guy. Um, but, uh, so, uh, like Bechet and Pops Foster together, that, that, that's gold. Um, so there's this tune, uh, I politically speaking, I don't, you know, there's so many tunes that are just coming up and I'm so tired of how things used to be and how they currently still are and hopefully won't be. Um, China Boy is the name of the tune. So forgive the politically incorrect crap. Tune's good. Um, the uh, recording that uh, I'm thinking of is uh it's wild bill davison and uh and bechet and i'm kicking myself because i can't remember the rest of the band um other than pops foster um the uh i can't remember what year it is either uh bat in a thousand i think it's not uh um, it might be on a, a compilation called the fabulous Sidney Bechet might be a different record though. Anyway, whatever. I'll, I'll play that. You had talked about doing like a back. Oh, you want to play it? Oh, great. So you're going to do I, a little I, back and track. Yeah. yeah. If, if you, if that's what awesome. you like, I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that went the, great uh, last, last week when Kevin played with the uh, Los Codillas. So we should keep this tradition as long as possible. Wait, so, is that do, what is uh, so uh, it's a china boy it's china boy um and i'll do it uh i'm not going to play through and you know chorus after chorus after chorus um i'll play it i'm not going to promise to play it exactly note for note but like one of the the i love this tune because it, it has like uh some really really clear devices that pop swaster used a lot and uh they're more or less these little chunks he's doing over each each chord. Um, and you can hear him do it. Like you, you learn it in, in this one tune and you can hear him in a lot of, you can hear that in a lot of other tunes that he's doing. It's just his standard vocabulary. So I'll play I'll play through the first chorus like that and then maybe do a second chorus the way yeah, I would do it. As long as you want, man. Yeah. As long as you want, you know. People are here like to, you know, hear you play. Here you talk too, but I'm sure that you know preference would be yeah. here you playing. So grab your bass. Cool. I will. All right. While Ryan is grabbing his bass, first I'd like to ask you: Do you still hear us fine? I noticed that John Stansel wrote your echoing now. Anybody else has that problem or? Or maybe it's on his end. I hope it's not on our end. I'm not sure like how to fix it right now because it, everything was fine until now. So please let me know in these in the live chat on the side. Another thing that I wanted to mention, I would like um, to hear uh, your suggestions. Like who would you like to see me feature in a future episodes? And the best way to do that is to write down the comment um below the video so not in the live chat live chat is just like for our conversation right now but like if you if you post below the video i will be able to check out your suggestion and get in touch with those guys and hopefully feature them in one of the future shows so whoever you feel like um 
seen here in play. That would be great. And Ryan is ready. So let's do this. You look good, man. You look good. That sound all right? Yeah, sounds great. All right, here we go. hearing you play uh show the i want to show you to show your 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 the the distance from your strings to the fingerboard kevin and we were talking about it uh last last weekend but what is it like what you know people love love that nerdy stuff like what have you ever measured it uh yeah i'm at uh I think the last time I looked at it, it was 18 millimeters. So, uh, like, so take uh, that uh, jazz guys. <laughs> uh, thank you. Don Mopsick, uh, used to play with Jim Cullum down in San Antonio. I think he's in Florida now. Uh, fantastic player. Um, and got to hang out with Milton Hinton and, and all kinds of old bass players. Um, he, uh, he had his at 30 millimeters. So, you know, if I'm high, you know, he was, he was up here basically. Like wow. if, you, if you find photos of him playing on the, on the internet, you can, you know, like right now I can, you know, I'm sticking my hand through it, my fingers through it. He can, I'm sure I can get my whole hand through his. Um, <laughs> and then it, like in that Pops Foster book, there's a whole, and, and, all over, even even more modern bass players into the 40s, uh, they were playing on high action too. Um, you can hear it. You know, they didn't have amps, and that's the way. You know, it's the way this instrument was built to be played with high action and guts. You know, that's an argument I'd love to have at any time, and I'm ready to. But the uh, um, the there's photos in that Pops Foster book. Uh, that show like Ed Garland and and Wellman Bro and Pop Swaster, they all have high high action, and uh, um, and Don Mopsick like swore up and down by it, and uh, it's just how you like that's how you kind of had to do it, I guess. You know, there's something about the sound that you're getting, the the projection of the sound is just like 
that's it. You know, if you want to sound like Bill Johnson or Pops Foster, you should do that. So, yeah. well, you're definitely achieving that. Right, um, I got like like into a little bit of uh, of this discussion with Kevin, but I'm I'm curious to hear while you still have your base with you, um, your opinion about that slab based terminology. You know, like what's what would be uh, what would be a single slap for you? Uh, single slap for me is just. You know, some people call that snap. And for me, it's, it was kind of like always, I, I don't want to say ridiculous, but a little bit ridiculous because it's, no, when you play like that, everybody say, oh, he's slapping the bass. And then when you ask somebody that wants to name it, says so like, Oh, but that's snap. It's not yeah. like a single slap is when you add. So, so I don't want to, you know, put my own opinion in in your show. <laughs> uh, but tell me, so little demonstration. Like, so single slap you showed me. What would be a double slap? Are you using? Oh, so which? I mean, which terminology are you using? Which which of these terms? It's it's in your vocabulary. I don't know that I have a standard terminology. I think most of the time I line up with how you're describing it. I just, I kind of, if I really have to get academic about it, I guess I talk about it within the context of the music. You know, like is, you know, like what is this? Or what is, it's not so much about like, I'm going to call that a double slap because I'm hitting it twice. I'm hitting the fingerboard twice. You know, does that make any sense? Sure. For me, the first one is a triplet, and the other one is version of a triple slap, just gallop. Right. So that if if I have to like name it academically, that's usually how I'm going for it. Cool. All I right. I'm glad we're on, on on board with that. I um, think that if you uh, if like if if you call this something other than slap and you're talking about the technique then you can't give bill johnson credit for being a slap bass player or you can't exactly really that, that's my point exactly my point exactly None of them, you know neither of those guys were doing this a whole lot yep. anytime exactly. you hear foster doing it is in like late 40s and and early 50s and uh i did a couple of weeks ago in uh just skimming through the Lawrence Gushy book on uh, the Creole band, uh, which is a lot about Bill Johnson. Uh, Highly recommended. Yeah, totally. Um, Pioneers of Jazz is what it's called by Lawrence Gushy. And uh, I stumbled across a, a little uh, paragraph uh, that I didn't remember actually reading it through ages ago. Um, there's a uh, there's a quote from Milt Hinton in there that he said Milt Hinton actually says in Chicago he saw Bill Johnson uh, using the side of his hand to uh, to do triplets. So, I mean, I've I never remember that quote. Do any triplets? But uh, man, I would love to hear that. And I also remember another Milt Hinton quote. I'm not sure where it's coming from. I believe it's from the Milt Hinton's book, the big one. Uh, that he said that everybody before him were playing uh, double slaps and triplets, but he was the only one that was able to play quadruples. Hmm. I forgot which which book. I'll I'll, I'll probably wrote wrote down that somewhere, but I remember exactly that I that I heard that. And one thing that I want to want you to show for this section lesson with Ryan to. To our, our our viewers, is uh, something specific for your playing. Uh, first time I heard you playing was probably some of your recordings or online or whatever. Um, but I noticed that you're using a technique uh, more than 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 other players that, that that you call it. Oops, oops, two, three, or oops, yeah. one, two, whatever you call it, and oh. um, and. For I me, think we give J.D. Pendley credit for calling it that, by the way. 
Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, for, for me, it was always um, like, I would call it reverse gallop. Mm -hmm. uh, if, it's, if it's with two um, hits before the note. And kind of like the for, interesting thing about uh, for, uh, for about that for me was that you're not you're kind of skipping uh, one or three so you're you're doing the anticipation or like the 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 how did how, how did you say yes you pick up two upbeats right okay. so yeah. I would like you to demonstrate that and to play. Um, Play something. Teach me something. Like show, show. Uh, do you want to teach me something? Teach, teach yeah. me that. I'm, I want to use. You know, I'll always use this opportunity to learn something. You know, so that's my little trick and real reason why I'm doing this. Sneaky. So I'll have like hundreds of people here at the show, and I'll learn hundreds of licks. <laughs> you should do it too. Grab your bass. So all right. So what you're gonna show me? Uh, all right. We talked a little bit about this. Um, I had never actually thought about it in terms of reverse gallop, and I, I loved that you had said that. Um, and it did kick off this this concept of, uh, you know, like it. The better way for me to think about it is is it is pickups to whatever it is I'm doing next. Um, and to that end, uh, John Doyle and I were talking about it a year ago. Um, about like creating bass lines and why you would do stuff like this. So as far as uh, like a context where I would use this, it's uh, I think I I won't say across the board 100%, but uh, a lot of the reason I, I drop beat one or beat two is to emphasize or sorry, drop beat one or three is to emphasize beat two or four to turn it around a little bit. It, and that is very much related to Willie Lyons piano playing. Um, and, uh, so I get, I get a good way to think of it for me is that, uh, like beat, like having that pause on beat one or three, um, and then using it as a pickup into two or four is it just, it propels whatever melody I'm playing baseline, baseline melody, same thing as far as I'm concerned. So let's do a lick. All righty. A lick. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll be flat. <laughs> Let's do step by step. So first one is B flat. So I'm playing notes. Um, what is C flat? Uh, sorry, B flat, C and D. Yeah. And B then flat, it's D. D G. Low D to G. Okay. Um, so that's kind of like B flat six. Yeah. Okay, I notice in your playing that you often play those, you know, sixths or thirteens, whatever you call it. You know, like more than other people. Um, it's interesting. Kevin's like also from last week included six. That six kind of adds that little melodic feel. Um, oh, cool. All right. So, uh, so fir first part, show, show it to me again. Okay. Right? Perfect. Okay. And then from the G, we go to C. C, G, E, E, F. Those are the notes? Yeah. Uh, and what are the slaps? Uh, so a little sixteenth note uh, quadruplet. Like that? Uh, yeah. So. 
yeah. I found I find myself. Uh, I think it was the thing Kevin was was doing last last week, but uh, and and Kevin and I actually hung out on Thursday night this week, and uh, I, I want Kevin to know that from playing his bass uh, for however long we were trading it back and forth, working on this weird thing in ten, uh, I pulled Hello. off my thumb on your bass. <laughs> Um, it's interesting yeah. how like a different setup like can really affect your your playing and you can get calluses even if you're playing bass that it's considered like easier to play. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's crazy. Like I you know, if I do a fly out, no matter how many times you tell a festival person, you know, I need action that's this high, you know, they give you something with no action on it. Um <laughs> but I'll go and I'll try to play it. And even if it's got a little bit of height on it, it's I end up getting hurt more playing a lower action bass than I do on a higher action bass. You know, I mean, it's the way I've set my body up, of course, but it's just, it's, it's wild. Anyway. Oh, yeah. that, well, let's, that, let's do that lick again. I don't want to for, forget it. Like, am I missing anything? Can you play the whole lick again? So that, that second half from the, the C to the G. Uh, so... Ah. That was what Kevin was Extra slow. You're doing roll to triplet? Uh, just the. Yeah. Okay. Extra slap. Ah. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Yeah, you bet. All right, hopefully all of you got it too. All right. Let me you 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 leave your bass with you. Will do. Uh stop laughing at me, Kevin. Cool. Yeah. Hey Kevin. All right. Um, so what is the next thing that I wanted to ask you? Um, it's about the band leaders that you were playing with or that you played in the past. Like we know that lots of those guys, like I mean, not the people, your band leaders, but lots of uh, band leaders have that um, vision you should use slap this much, or you should use slap this much, or you should not use slap at all. I wonder what the guys that you're playing with or, and the ones that you were playing with before, uh, what do they, what do they say? Like, what do, you know, what is their opinion about slap? Uh, very few people have told me to not slap, um, which is good because it's what I want to do. Um, I think, uh, you know, like, I, I feel like I'm doing it tastefully. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been, like, I've done a few. The, the only weird thing that I've ever really come across in a, in a kind of consistent way is uh, there for a little while, especially, you know, the first, like, five years of, of playing professionally in Austin, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be at regular gigs and a lot of folks, uh, I don't want to give singer songwriters a bad name. There's loads of amazing singer songwriters, but I was, I just happened to be getting, uh, hired by a lot of singer songwriters to go into the studio and, and record their albums. Uh, and, uh, they would come and say, Hey, like what, I love what you're doing. You're so like, you have this thing, blah, 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 compliment, compliment, you know, it's great. Um, 
and I go in the studio and they'd say, like, I would ask them, what, what do you want me to do? And, uh, they'd say, just do what you do at that show. I saw you doing, you know, and, uh, I would slap through their tunes and they would say, yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Maybe a little bit less slap, which in my mind was weird because I wasn't doing a load of slap. I'd just be, you know, doing a little two beat show or, or a shuffle or whatever. It wasn't anything, wasn't anything, you know, it wasn't like just doing like, you know, 16th note slaps through the entire song. Like I wasn't, I don't, I didn't think I wasn't being tasteful. Um, or I thought I was being tasteful, excuse me. Um, but, uh, you know, and then it would go in these phases, you know, like you'd play a tune, like, great. It started out the way, like me playing the way they heard me play at the show where they hired me. And then, you know, step by step we go okay oh, i don't have to record this tune one more time this time less slap so i you know you ask them what does that mean and then by the end of the you know like you record the tune four or five times and by the end of the tune by the, the end of the when they finally get the take they want i'm not slapping a bit I'm like, <laughs> why didn't you just tell me don't slap i can do that too yeah it just you know? You know, singer songwriters usually don't know what they want. They have some kind of idea in their head. Yeah, you know, that's what producers are for. You know, you want to. We want to get a producer, and then producers producers hire the right guys for the job, or like they at least know what to say to the musicians that they they're hiring. So I mean, that's that's usually you know, helpful. Um, yeah. In the style of music that you are playing with, which is early jazz, uh, primarily, let's say, uh, but you can you can elaborate on this, like for the other styles that that you played. Uh, what is the function of slap? How would you describe describe uh, slap bass and the stuff that you're doing? How does that help uh, the song? Um, I would say. So in, 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 in bands without drummers, I, uh, and I, at least the first five years of playing in Austin were definitely bands with no drummers. I think the only, uh, the Jazz Pharaohs was the only band I had that had a drummer and he was, uh, was salt, uh, John Salmon Salty. Uh, he, uh, he just played hi-hat and snare and the two of us just locked in didn't matter. Uh, um, I actually just realized that like, I think that might be the first time I saw Kevin Smith playing live. He was he was the bass player in the Jazz Flowers for a little while, um, right before I joined. Uh, the uh, that band was the only one with, with a snare and a hi hat. Um, so it's my job in in all of those drummerless bands to to add percussion. Um, and then of course drive. I think drive is inherent with with slap. If you're not driving and slapping, I, that's it's a mystery how that could happen. Um, so in bands with drummers, uh, which I'm most of the bands I mean now have a drummer. Uh, and that still feels new to me, but uh, um, I think in that situation, I'm still slapping. For the most, especially in, in in an early jazz band, I'm still slapping. I'm never gonna not slap in that situation, um, unless I'm using a bow. You know, it's rare that I'm pitzing in an early jazz situation. It's it's mostly slap, and I'd say it's like seventy five percent slap and twenty five percent bow. Um, the uh, so slap's function in that is definitely drive it's some percussion um I, I would think of it more as like for accent and dynamics and and texture there's always there's so many nice textures to get between the drummer and uh guitar player chunk and rhythm or a banjo player um or all three or even a pianist you know like the rhythm section there's, there's just so many elements that you can mess with as far as 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 color texture with slap and what about blues like do you, do you ever play blues in in austin how's 
you know, like that the old school really... blues had slaps often, and then you know nowadays or electric blues doesn't have it almost at all. So I I don't. What, what's your take on that? Do you do that? I play blues in jazz bands, but not not okay. in the, not what I think most people would consider to be like the blues genre. I just haven't found myself in those gigs at all. Talking about blues, um, do you have any slap bass players from that world? Any slap um, bass influences from that world? Sorry. I think just Willie Dixon. Dixon. Oh, uh, that would be actually a good thing like to show. We were talking about a couple of, you know, a couple of times like before, like we were talking about that line that, that you kind of got from Willie Dixon. Do you mind? Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you yeah, yeah, show that? yeah. It's yeah. a chromatic from C. Yeah. Chromatic okay. from whatever, but we'll do it from C. Okay. Um, and I, I like, I got it from Willie Dixon via Bo sample. I think Bo is the one that, that got me thinking about it. Uh, Those you want to see that right in. That's a cool line. You're basically kind of like stopping the note, yeah, and like in kind of creating uh, more of a blues swing, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's that. I I really wanted you to show show that line. Um, yeah, come back here, like so. You can leave your base for for a second, so we can talk, and then you can grab it again later on. Um, okay, so we got like a couple comments. Thanks, Jean Philippe. Uh, emphasis or accentuation on some note phrasing too. Um, I'm not sure if you're asking a question or that's uh, something that you want to tell us that we're already that Brian is already doing, but I can definitely hear accenting the certain beats and uh, the drive in Ryan's playing. All right, and um, till Ryan comes back, please don't forget to subscribe here here somewhere in this area and um, that means a lot and consider uh supporting us i put like a few li uh, links right below this uh, video thanks for all the people that are live chatting with us if you want to see a specific player featured uh, during the on the slap stream write down in the comments below the videos so regular youtube comments so that way i'll be able to check that out and and um call them and schedule slap stream a call from the slapsville um all right so ryan is back let him back here this is about him and it's not about me um one thing that that it's that lots of people struggle with is how to get a gig what what would be your recommendation how do you get i talked a little bit with kevin about it last week but you know i want to hear your um your opinion how do you get all those gigs i mean as i said like you were like so busy at one point it was kind of like it seemed that every band in austin wanted ryan gould to play slap bass with them so how how, how do you get all those gigs how what what's the the process uh well i would say invent a vaccine for coronavirus <laughs> i think that's step number one um how do you get a gig um i mean do people call you or you call them or like you know, when I moved to the States, I was so confused. I was like, how am I going to meet anyone? You know, so I played on the street. That didn't work. I I went to every possible um, party, you know, that, that there were any kind of jammers. Like so, so from Cajun musicians to bluegrass musicians. And then 
I knocked on everyone's doors, like sent like tons of emails. Then I realized lots of bass players were posting ads on Craigslist or stuff like that. So I, I, I don't think they ever did that, but, but it, it was kind of frustrating. So, so I want to know what's your experience. Like, how did you get all those gigs? You know, you moved from, you know, from Philly to Austin. Uh, so at one point, you probably didn't know anyone. So how did you meet all those people? Why are they calling you? When I mean, I know why they're calling. They're calling you because you're amazing. But, um, you know, how did you get in? How, how that's it? How do you get a gig? I think, uh, like, for me, I mean, it's, I think it's really important to realize that I live in a music town. You know, like, there's so much live music in Austin. Um, so that that's definitely an element. I can't imagine what it would be like, you know, trying to get gigs when you're, you know, in the middle of nowhere or in a in a town where there's there's enough music, but you know, only happens on the weekends or whatever. So I think my experience might be a little bit uh or a lot colored by that. Um, but I do know that uh like I know that when I got here, there were just so many musicians that I wanted to hear that I went out every night. You know, I wasn't playing. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I would go out um, and listen to two or three different bands a night um, and then slowly just get to know the players. Um, not even slowly. I just as soon as I could, I was getting to know players um, and just asking them what makes them tick, you know, letting them know I play bass, asking them, you know, what I should be working on. Um, just listening and learning, appreciating, participating um, in any way I could, contributing if I could, you know. Um, and then, uh, like, practice. So playing as much as possible, basically. Is that, is, is that kind of the thing? In Austin? Sure. Yeah, I would, you know, like when, once I, again, because it's such a live music town, you know, I started playing with Shorty Long doing uh, with Pops and John. And, you know, once we got a regular gig, that's when everything started happening for me. Cause I, you know, once a week I was playing in front of an audience and, you know, people in the crowds would hear me and go and tell their musician friends or musicians would come through because they're like, Oh, this, I heard this, this bass player is doing something. So I'm going to go check that out, you know? So I, th I think it's like getting like more than just like knocking on people's doors, like this squeaky wheel is always going to get the grease of course. But like, if you have something where like, yeah, you should poke people. Um, but you have to like, they have to see you, you know, like they have to come on you. They have to come across you. Sorry. Uh, the, uh, like out of an honest situation, I think, you know, like once they hear you like in your own thing, in your own environment, um, then I think that's when they're more likely to, uh, to ask you to, to be a part of their band. Of course. And then, as far as like, like I've never had a huge gig, you know, like I, I haven't had a big name gig, you know, like I toured with Wayne Hancock for a short amount of time, you know, and right now, you know, like I'm playing with Floyd Domino, which is great. Um, but I've been playing with Floyd for years and years and I met him, I met him through Eric Hoken and, you know, a lot of, I, I've just, so much of my work has been local and with, with amazing musicians you know like eric hokanen is is an interstellar genius um so if you ever get a chance check out eric hokanen um uh like through him i met a whole bunch of other amazing musicians and he's even you know suggested to other band leaders like hey if you need a bass player you should check out ryan gould um yeah, that's, I think that's my best answer to all of that is just being like practicing, getting gigs, you know, one gig leads to the next and being available. And especially at the beginning, like I wouldn't, like I don't do it now because I, I find 
that there's a lot of other stuff I need to be doing on top of gigs. But uh, man, you're right. When I started, I I just didn't say no to gigs at all. I needed to uh, to be on the scene, as as John Stansel said. I needed to. Uh, um, I was playing two and three gigs a night, six and seven days a week. You know, I was glad, like I had the opportunity and I wasn't, I probably should have said no to more of those gigs, but I just wanted to be playing. It didn't matter. Sometimes I'd come, come home from a gig, like a two hour gig with $6 in my pocket and it was horrifying and wrong. And like, I shouldn't do that from a cultural standpoint or, you know, it's not, it's not healthy for the system for any of us to be taking gigs that pay six bucks, but, um, but it made you, made you who you are, right? Yeah. Yeah. It certainly, I could build up the calluses and build up the chops, you know, like gave me loads of experience. Like how do I deal with this kind of drunk person? How do I deal with that kind of drunk oh, yeah. person? How do I deal with the band leader? Who's off the, the rails? How do I deal with, you know, you know, we all have to be psychologists in a way, right? Uh, for sure. Yeah, without a doubt. You know, and then how do I, you know, like, how do I play through like massive depression? And how do I play through anger? And how do I express all of that? Like, how do I like, what is it that I'm doing with music? Like, here, like, I'm sitting in front or I'm standing in front of a crowd. And uh, you, uh, like, I have to like, like here's this person sitting in front of me like what is it that this person's thinking and what does this person need out of the music right now in this very moment and uh that's stuff you learn on the gig and and i like honestly i think that's one of the things that makes each of us who we are like i'm really plugged into that sort of thing and i think that's like i take that to gigs with me you know sure Everybody has like it, it's own, their own approach, you know. When I moved here, like I just wanted to play, like anything that came out on my way. But then, then, then I, then at one point, I decided, you know, I, sh I don't want to do this. You know, I want to like be picky and just play stuff that I, that makes sense. So I kind of like switched my, um, my approach after I, after I played like. A lot in those like a few a few years with pretty much anyone that called me um so that's kind of like the you know kind of the thing that people don't understand about musicians and all the all the all the hard stuff that we have to deal with mm -hmm. like yeah. i don't know all the time um i want to hear about um what what would be the most essential slab based recordings that you would recommend? Uh, well, like first and foremost for slap, uh, for early jazz, uh, that hello, can you go box set is, I, I think I said it earlier, it's just gold. It's so worth it. Um, uh, I mean, the recordings on it, like even, I, I hate to say don't go buy the thing, but the the, rec the records on that thing are all over YouTube. It's, you know, but you should buy it because the work, uh, the guy's name uh, is Dick Spotswood, I think, that put the book together, that did all the, the annotations in it. Um, there's another guy's name in there, uh, Eddie Dean, I think. Uh those guys put this, it's such a good compilation. It covers a lot of good ground. Um, and that book is is really worth whatever price you're going to pay. I think when I got it, it was like 80 bucks and it's now down to 20 or 30 bucks, which is a steal. Can you still get it? This this is it. If you guys are not familiar, this is the, I got it like when it was a pre-order and yeah. it really looks cool. Like, like yeah, they have like these three, three CDs and the book that Ryan is talking about. It's all right, so these are my notes <laughs> that yeah. I wanted to add, uh, but this is the book and it's all about anthology of the string bass 1925 until 1941. If you're not, it's, it's, it's real deal. It's, you know, it's a, yeah. it's, it's great. Um, Make sure to check that one. I always wanted to, to write down the, 
uh, a review for Art of Slow Base of this. And I will one of these days. I'm just not sure when. I always have these ideas. I want to do this. And now this is Slapstream. It's all focused on that. The, the first disc is 95 to uh, 1930. And it's with Steve Brown on the cover. Yeah. If you're not familiar with Steve Brown, make sure to check out Dinah by Gene Colgate Orchestra. My pretty the second girl. one is, and I'm really glad they put her on the cover. It's uh, yeah. Thelma Terry, amazing bass player from, I think that she spent most of her life in Chicago. I might be yeah. wrong though, but I, I, I believe so. And it's, um, it's basically 30s, 1931 until 1941. And the third one, uh, third CD is Bill the Johnson, man. the demand. He's the guy. That, that third um, CD too of Bill Johnson is uh, like he did. He it's it's all stuff from uh, between twenty seven and twenty nine, I think. And uh, it's it's really uh, it's it's interesting material because it's not how he was playing with the Johnny Dodds band or like the earlier stuff that he recorded was just straight quarter note feel like what what I think most people think of as early jazz bass. But the and stuff is pure, pure magic. Yeah, it's it's that it's a different kind of energy, and and I think like that that third CD is a great uh, companion piece for uh, that uh, Pioneers of Jazz book, the the gushy book on the Creole. Oh, band. absolutely, absolutely. And, like I, if you read the description of of that band's playing that Gushy finds in newspaper articles and so on and so forth. Um, it describes this kind of weird, you know, like those guys were playing, you know, like in 1908 or something in LA or something. Um, they were playing jazz before, you know, before anybody was going to call it jazz. Um, they, uh, the way he's finding descriptions of that music in there is, you know, like you might call it proto jazz or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I, or, or, like, or I, the jazz. Uh, I call it, uh, uh, I think of it as, as hokum and, uh, you can even hear some of those guys, you know, like it ain't hokum on, on that third CD. Uh, but, uh, it's like an earlier style. And I think honestly, you know, I, I can't say for sure. Cause it's just not how history works, but, uh, uh, I think that third CD is basically what early jazz sounded like before 1917s you know before before we can put a, a as much of a label it as i'm willing to put on it after the original dixieland jazz band um that's a whole other go down that road plenty um i guess what i'm saying is like that that third cd is this really cool glimpse into what jazz probably sounded like before we were calling it jazz and uh, it's interesting that, you know, whatever, you know, progressive evolutions happened since the, the Creole band to that the late 20s recordings with Bill Johnson, he just basically went back to playing that style because a couple of those guys on those records that he's playing with were from the Creole jazz band. So it just seems, you know, like, hey, guys, get together and do what you used to do. And uh so that like that that third CD is definitely like strongly recommended listening as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, I I love it. So since we were talking about jazz, jazz bass and slap and all of that stuff, um, what do you think was the reason or uh, or the reasons why uh, slap became kind of like almost bad word <laughs> in jazz? I would I would always say I would I, I always wanted to choose 1939 as the the year uh, when kind of slap died in jazz. Um, that's the year when I believe that's the year when Jimmy Blanton joined Duke Ellington and kind of changed uh, everything about a bass in in jazz situation. And that's the year that that usually jazz historians choose as kind of the starting point of of jazz bass, which for me, it's absolutely not true. And um, it, it 
it developed and Jimmy Blanton is great and he was a slapper too he played slap in one of one uh, one tune I think the one recording that he did with uh with Duke and so so that's what I want to hear what was the reason why slap died in jazz by your opinion mm. I, I I've thought about this a lot I really don't know I'm sure it has something to do uh I, I think there's a couple of reasons um I I won't say that it's necessarily the uh, a lack of dance because uh, you know there was jazz was still a dance music through the 40s so it, it fading out doesn't make tons of for for that reason doesn't make loads of sense um, I think that uh, like the Basie band was. Uh, you know, like I guess we could argue that Basie Band and uh, and the Ellington Band were probably the biggest influences. You know, the biggest evolutions, uh, the the obvious evolutions in uh, in jazz from from early stuff into you know like the bridge into like swing and bop, um, the uh, swing then bop. Uh, so I'd say. Like listening to, like, like Walter Page in the Basie Band was a huge, huge sound, um, and I would argue that he, part of the reason he had such a big sound with his pits was that he he was a slap player before he was a pits player. Um, uh, but they they set that mold for whatever reason he was I don't know why he wasn't slapping with the Basie band you know it just went that way I suppose um, and I it's think it's kind of weird it's almost like like until thirty nine everybody was slapping and from thirty nine nobody was slapping I mean not yeah. literally but it, it's kind of right. it's like wow this is somebody like you know like put you know took scissors and there's like Tuk. no now no more slap. So yeah. weird, but you know, it's. I always thought, you know, jazz, like even more progressive um, jazz styles, would sound cool with with, and they do sound cool with with some slapping. And you I know, I've never heard uh, anyone really don't like slapping. You know, like they did. It's, it's sometimes it's like it could be like too much, but but it's, sure. that that comes down to the, to someone's taste. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as nowadays uh, slap bass players, um, who would you recommend, like, for people to to listen to, hear, and uh, and learn? Um, there's this one guy. He's crazy. His name's George A. Stepovich. <laughs> like, I like what he's doing. Um, Kevin Smith, obviously. Um, like hands down, one of my favorite bass players for early jazz uh, is Marty Eggers. Uh, he's out in San Francisco area. Um, he just he, I I'll argue that he plays uh, um, Pops Foster better than I would. I mean, he he might argue the opposite, but um, but I love Marty. He's such a great player. He's a great guy too. Um, Actually, out in California too, uh, Katie Cavera and Clint Baker also are totally rocking it. Uh, I love the way they play; their style is just so good. And it's—I mean, it's, it's all like Pops Foster style, just straight quarter notes. But they, they have such a big driving sound; I love it. Um, Nicola De uh in in Bordeaux, without a doubt, he's he's. he's it's definitely one of my favorites. Um, and uh, he and you, I think, turned me on to the, uh, that guy in France, uh, Gilles Chevaucherie. I yeah, think his name Gilles Chevaucherie. Um, I, I dig what he's doing. Um, I, went to his, I went Me and Nicola went to his uh, 60th birthday party. <laughs> so it was, it was, it was amazing. I played his bass and played with his band. It was really cool. It was really cool. I mean, meeting that guy. I wanted to meet that guy since I was a kid. I'm, mm. I'm pretty sure, like, not many of uh, um, of our audience 
or in general, like outside of France, like uh, would be familiar with Jill. But Jill is top notch um, slab bass player. I mean, he's the guy that played. He was subbing for Willie Dixon. I mean, that says something. And he was doing all kinds of cool stuff, like on the bass. Really tasteful. I love Jill. I wanted to meet him since I was in high school or something. I found somehow I found his recordings and was like blown away and was like oh this is the guy i want to meet i want to hang out with i want to you know take lessons from i never did but he's still the guy yeah um all right i think like, uh, that was him nikolai and jill are awesome they are for sure jake um, Irwin, sure uh in town um i'm i'm sure I know you're probably familiar with with Tyler Thompson twerk. Um, uh, Mark Rubin told me about him. I'm not very familiar with his work, but you know, Mark Rubin told me about twerk. Man, he, he's phenomenal. I love him. He's he, he's just as much a geek for slap as anybody. Um, and he's he's doing some awesome stuff. Um, Don Mopsick. Uh, Nothing amazingly fancy as far as like complex slap stuff, but man, he's just, he knows what he's doing. He's been around for so long. He's, he's, he's well worth sitting down and, and he's got so much to share. I love it. Um, there are some new folks that I've been checking out too. Uh, just through, you know, the, the glory of Instagram and seeing people's stories. Uh, so got a young guy named William Ledbetter. I think I think he's William. Uh, he goes by Mo Betta Ledbetter on uh, Instagram. Um, he's he's got some he's got some slap stuff going on. Um, he has kind of like a little little bit of that Roland Garin or Milt Hinton style yeah. down, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really dig I like that. him. And then he turned me on to uh, a guy named Barry. Uh, Barry Stevenson, I think is his, his last name. Another young guy. Oh yeah, yeah. He is he, like a similar similar yeah, style. He actually studied with with Roland in New yeah. Orleans, and he's he's got the same kind of Milton Hinton thing going on. Super cool. Um, I just discovered uh, a woman in in Italy. That's uh, her name is Francesca uh, Alinovi, I think. Um. She's uh, it's real, real clean playing. Uh, I'm not familiar yeah. with her. Is that also like Pops Foster, old school? No, dad? she's playing like country stuff. They, country she's okay. got a duo uh, with a guitar player. Um, and I love bass in a duo format. It's just oh, yeah. I love trying to figure out how that works. Um, That's great. Yeah, no, that gives you lots of uh, space, like to slap or like you know whatever you want to do. Nicola did did a couple of a couple of duets on his um, yeah. on his uh, YouTube channel. It's great. Yeah, with, check with it out. Yeah, uh, uh -huh. I I discovered that Francesca is doing a lot of. Uh, she's also, I guess, into a lot of like intelligent movement disciplines too, uh, or like taking taking like a more uh, mindful approach to playing and like letting your body kind of guide. Actually, I want to like talk to you about it. Like, but Mark Bass asked, uh, "How do you spell Jill's last name?" So I want to show that to everyone. I tried to reply only to Mark, but like it point out this way, which might be even better, uh, so everyone can 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 actually see it here. So it's Jill. Um, check him out. Uh, so you, you mentioned actually like before that you studied Alexander technique, right? And how do you, um, how do you apply that to your slab bass playing <laughs> or, or, or yeah. you know, to, to anything in life? Um, so I, if, if I'm assuming that not everybody knows what Alexander is out there. So, uh, for that info, uh, it's a uh, Alexander's a movement discipline that uh, just focuses on. So I, I guess the the best way to to really get into it is that, uh, or to scratch the surface of it, is that uh, 
in my experience of it, basically you get a sense of, you, you learn a really basic sense of anatomy, like skeletal anatomy. Um, you know, like you learn about what joints do what, how they're supposed to function. Um, and then with that sense, you start getting a sense, you, you develop an awareness of, of ease in, in your movement. Um, and then there's a, uh, I guess like I've been doing it for 15 years now. Um, I've been practicing it on my own. I haven't been, I, I took with a couple of different, uh, teachers for a while. I, I was steady for a little while, uh, doing weekly stuff with the, with the best Alexander teacher I ever experienced was Jane, uh, Jane Clanton Bick. Uh, she's no longer in, in Austin, uh, but she's, she's so good. Um, well, from, from, from the start, you know, like got a great foundation from her. She's like a second generation, uh, like a generation removed from Alexander himself. So she's got a really good solid connection there. Um, but uh, like from 15 years ago, we're 15 years plus really, uh, the, uh, I've gone through phases, like you learn about anatomy, you learn about like a really physical sense of Alexander and how to like breathe and, and find a good neutral place for your body and, and how to relax through a lot of stuff and that you don't need to hold stuff um, and at this point in my life, it's Alexander's taken this shape with like what, what language I use to, you know, like what, a, even language I think in, you know, like if I'm practicing and I go, oh, that sucked, you know, I'm obviously not going to learn. I'm going to, I'm going to learn whatever it is I just played, but I'm going to learn it in such a crappy way. You know, I'm just going to be like, great. I just really negatively enforced whatever thing I didn't want to happen. And now it's just going to be there. So that either becomes the way I play, which becomes an angry, grumpy, whatever, or, or I just can't get past it. You know, it just becomes this wall that I, I can't, I can't climb. Um, or if I go, cool mistake, that was fun. You know, like, cool, you know, like it, in jazz, you know, they say, uh, one time's a mistake, two times is jazz, you know? And uh, so if you, you get into that mentality, just like, cool, that wasn't exactly what I wanted, but it's cool, I'm all right with it. It, it doesn't seize your body up, you don't get angry, whatever. So how I use it in bass is just that I'm constantly looking for places where I'm holding any kind of, you know, like muscularly holding on to things or mentally holding on to things. And, and now at this point, even spiritually holding on, like emotionally holding on to things, you know, whatever, you know, mu you know, muscular, like physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, if I'm holding on to anything too tightly, I'm just going to either strangle it out or I'm going to, you know, build up some sort of wall that I can't get past. So that's that's I hopefully I hopefully answered that question. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, people can, you know, research more about it. But I wanted to mention that that um, mention Alexander technique and how important is basically to be relaxed. Like when you yeah. when you're uh, when you when you're slapping, especially when you're slapping in general, when you're playing music, but especially when you're using slap bass at uh, this. I think it's fair to say, too, that like. Alexander was a, is, is still a huge part of my approach, but I also, I spent almost, well, it's been 12 years now, but like 10 of those years, I was in a Japanese jujitsu dojo for like four or five days a week. Um, and that was also nearly the same as Alexander. Um, and I learned like 50% of that curriculum was shiatsu. So acupuncture with your thumbs. Um, and we had to, uh, so we really had to work on, uh, like we, we learned meridian theory. We learned how, basically from a Western standpoint, we're learning how fascia is connected all throughout the body and 
you know, what points do what and how do I, you know, like I can, I can grab your wrist and feel what's going on in your shoulder, you know, so on and so forth. And then I did Ashtanga yoga for uh, like five days a week for, for five years. Wow. Um, and I still like, I've been swimming for probably about almost 17 years now. Um, and all of that, like all of these, there's uh, all of these things have become one thing to me uh, as well as bass playing. It's all, it's all the same thing. It's, it's an active meditation. Like I'm constantly watching my breath and trying to just be as mindful as, as I possibly can in each moment, which goes right back to relaxation I'm just breathing and like really trying to like positively experience everything. Oh, and or just not judge anything negatively or positively, honestly. Um, and then uh, I've also I've also been, you know, I've seen a therapist for uh, for years and years. And uh, she introduced me to a, a PTSD treatment called uh, somatic experiencing. And uh, it's it's basically a guided meditation. Um, I don't want to go too deep into that because it's a huge conversation. But uh, through that therapy, um, I've learned a lot about why Alexander and Jiu Jitsu and Ashtanga and all of these moving meditations uh, kind of function the way they do and how learning, human learning kind of works. And there, I uh, like half of the, the work that I did for my master's in uh in ireland was uh was on was kind of based on uh a hungarian neuro neurologist's work uh chick send me high uh his work was on flow state and all of these things have come together for me to be like exactly how i'm playing like it's how i learn it's how i teach i'm actually developing a somatic teaching method where i'm not really like it's 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 academic for sure and there are like mechanical things that I that I teach, but uh, um, but I'm much more interested in the, in a holistic like getting people to learn, you know, like taking out this element. You know, we we think that we're basically just a head, and then we have these hands to connect to. But if you get, I'm not saying take the head away and take the hands away, but there's a whole body in here, which is a, a lot of what Alexander talks about. Like you take up all of this space, like you have a whole body and it has its own intelligence, you know, it, its own meaning like it functions in a lot of ways without a brain. Um, that's that's crazy talk in a lot of ways. So uh, forgive me for that. But at the end of the day, like everything is learning, you know, your muscles, your muscular systems, your fascia, it, it's all learning. It's all picking up on these things. And the more you can do to control that, the more you can do to just like relax and go, well, how am I going to actually use my emotional memory? You know, how am I going to use that to to both learn this new hard thing that I haven't been able to do and to actually use it on a gig? And when I use it on the gig, is it actually expressing the emotion that I want it to express? You know, and then once you get all of that in, you go to a gig and you know very authentically that you're expressing everything you do want to express from a really really genuine place because you've spent so much time just being in this flow state learning i've had a lot of students not a, i i mean not a lot of students but uh the students that i've been working on with uh the somatic stuff you know they they come in and go i can't do this i've been trying to do this on a gig for a year i i practice it you know for hours a day and then we just break things down into like, I want you to just play for five minutes, this one thing and use it as a guided meditation and then stop, go practice something else, go do, you know, go do the laundry, whatever, come back, do it another five minutes, 20 minutes later, stop again. If you're really crazy, do it another five minutes, 20 minutes later, spend 15 minutes a day doing one thing that's very, very mindful and not like completely centered in your body. And then that's all do it for five days, whatever they, then they come back to a lesson and go, how, how the heck did I learn that? 
like it's nothing like i can do it like i was born doing it you know so there's there's a lot of uh i'm finding a lot of success in in students coming like who are actually using that stuff people can use the link that you sh showed us like to as an uh, like to do that yeah right? for sure yeah just make um, sure you're this leads me to something that i wanted to ask you after all these years you've been playing for a long time and then what still drives you and what still inspires you to do what you do to still play bass to still slap it to still be excited about it to you know want to learn and like research and all of that um wow um everything inspires me really that's that's a cop out of an answer but uh um I think uh well the movement disciplines definitely keep me focused. I like that's where my head's been for for years now. Um uh like I would go to the dojo and practice, you know, throwing people around and uh um it just like maybe we want to go play bass because like oh i moved my body this way and how does that like i found a whole new thing where i didn't realize i was holding a bunch of stuff you know every time i find something new in my body that i thought i had relaxed and went oh no it wasn't relaxed cool let me go play bass you know so the, the movement disciplines for sure um obviously other musicians man the i i feel so lucky I'm so grateful for all the musicians that I've gotten to play with. Um, you know, like my my wife, Lauren, is an amazing, amazing musician. You know, I'm so lucky to have a partner who's just phenomenally gifted in the music department. But also who can I, understand what you what you where your heart is and where your passion is. That's yeah. And she, she, too, has studied all of this, the somatic movement stuff. Um, she's she's been in the dojo as long as I have. Out with all did all the Alexander did a lot of that Ashtanga um, swims with me, you know she's experienced. It's it's great to have a partner that's so linked up. We can we're always thinking a lot of the same thoughts as far as movement goes. Um, and obviously, you know we have the same taste in music. We're in most of the bands. We you know we're in together. <clears throat> I think like probably 90 percent of my gigs are with lauren and uh and it's great i really don't want it any other way honestly um i just like even if she wasn't my wife she's just such an amazing musician yeah she's awesome she mm. helped us out like figure out that uh vlad Yurel lick right right <laughs> last time i was at your place thank you yeah, her ears are ridiculous <laughs> and we spelled chick send me high correctly thank you mark that's awesome um all right we have some educated people here so. yeah i love it um uh man just listening to to Bechet and pops foster and all of these like the guys that started this music i can't it's funny that i've listened to some of these recordings a thousand times and every once in a while I, i'll think well i can't listen to this one more time and I'll not listen to it for a day or something, whatever, you know, some weird, I, it might go like, it might take a month where I'm just, because I get distracted and I'm listening to something else or building a new garden in the house and the yard or something. I don't know. Um, and then I'll stumble across that record a month later and go, man, this is amazing. Like what? These guys are still amazing and they're dead. You yeah, know, there's like, something about those recordings that are, they, they sound so fresh. They sound yeah. like so fresh and young and exciting. It's it's just amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. You know, I love love that stuff. That's definitely one of my favorite things. Uh, I Wait, wanted uh, to ask, did, did you want to say anything else? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you can play, play something. Play, I like, want to hear more of Ryan Gould. Play okay. whatever you want to play. I will. You can improvise. You can choose a song. You can make a medley. Just, just, just play. I want to hear you play, and I'm sure that you know our guys want to hear you play as well. And this comes oh. from Lauren. Love you. <laughs> uh, 
Um, well, I, I should say too, as far as uh, inspiration goes, uh, like community building is huge for me. You know, the fact that like what you're doing is so inspiring because, you know, like like Kevin and Bo and I started the the Austin Bass Hang 20 years ago, and and Josh has jumped on to like really start driving it even further. And, uh, you know, Brian and Gary and Chris Wade and all these guys have really helped build the, the community around it. Like Mark Rubin, you know, when I, when I first got to town, Mark Rubin and Kevin Smith were just like the biggest supporters I could ask for. They were, they just did everything they could to, to help me like get on my two, my own two feet. And I will, you know, I still got that Pops Foster book that Mark gave me. And that was like a, such a huge thing for me. You know, I think I still have a rock stop that Mark gave me. I think the pickup that I use, well, that I used to use, I haven't used an amp in years. Um, Actually, think, someone asked you about a pickup. What, what's your pickup preference? Uh, I don't have a preference. The, the, the pickup that Mark gave me was a David Gage realist. Um, and it works great. Still works great after all these years. How many? I don't. I don't know if Mark's listening, but geez, uh, I'm sure he gave that to me almost 20 years ago. Still works. Wow. You know, and it it's on my Framus. I don't use my Framus a lot. I actually use it more for a loner when friends come through town that need a bass that you can slap on, and uh, nobody ever complains. How many bases you have? I have three. three? I have, what are they? The Framus I was just talking about was is from the seventies. Um, bought it from Mark actually. Um, traded in my very first base for that. Um, the uh, uh, where was it going with that? Yeah, uh, I used that. How many for, bases did you have? Yeah, three. So, what's the um, second one? Uh, I have a, a Frechner that's here in the corner that I keep strung with steel strings and I, I don't play it anywhere near as much as I thought. Um, uh, I actually, anybody wants to buy a, a world war two era Frechner 2,400 bucks. It's yours. <laughs> um, just come and get it. Wear a mask. Um, and then what I'm playing on now is a 64 K and that's, got uh parastro cordas on the dng and uh eurosonics on the ena and i most definitely do not need any kind of sound reinforcement for that i haven't i mean I, it depends on the room obviously but if if i need sound reinforcement i just stick a microphone on it you know i mean i'm not because of the music that i'm playing i, I don't find myself really needing um really needing an amp and a pickup situation. That's the bass that you, that you're going to play now, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. All right. Grab the bass. Let's all right. Grab jam. it. All right. We are, we're close to the end. Uh, we're just going to wrap up with a couple more things until Ryan grabs the bass. Oh, he might actually be ready. So, let me, let's see. Yeah, he's ready. I am ready. I didn't get, I didn't get back here. All right. Slap it. Slap it. Slap it. Uh, uh, I'll play a little gospel tune. It might be on that Hello Can You Go compilation. Uh, I learned from Sam Morgan. Uh, the Sam Morgan Jazz Band. Uh, I mean, it's not their tune, but it's a gospel tune called uh, Over in the Glory Land. Thank you. 
That's awesome. That's so cool. Have you guys enjoyed it? Write down in the comments. <laughs> cool, man. Uh, I would like to ask the audience if they have some kind of any question for you while we're still here. We're wrapping up slowly. Um, so this song is called Over at the Glory Land. Is that what you said? Yeah, Over in the Glory Land. Cool. Um, and... I'm curious to hear how our audience, uh, where's our audience from? Like, where are you guys from? Please write down here in the live chat so we can see. Are you all from Austin or you're from California or wherever you're from? Um, if you wanna get links for future videos, make sure to send an email. Um, at contact at artofslabbase.com and we'll, we will be sending you emails each time we do the slap stream live from Slapsville. I want to mention that Ryan is part of Art of Slab Base as well. He's been writing great articles about uh, old school slab. Um, you wrote about Pops Foster yeah. and Bill Johnson. Um, what else? Like, like they were like, like a four or five, right? I remember doing the Pops Foster one and the Bill Johnson one. Did I do one on Ed Garland? No, I think the Jerzak did it. Jerzak did the video on Ed Garland, right? I did one on Zardis. Maybe he did, did both. Yeah, maybe. Like, I forgot now. But, like, head out to artofslabbase.com. Read um, Ryan's interview read um ryan's articles they're all great you can't find that information anywhere else now i like, after 10 or 11 years of doing this i'm kind of proud to say like there's no other website that can provide you with that much valuable information and ryan has been like great addition and and so I'm really happy to have you. Ryan, thanks so much for everything. Great playing as always. I really enjoyed. We finally made like all these our, our conversation public. So actually people can actually see what we're talking about, hear what we're talking about. So I want to thank you. Um, I want to read more Art of Slab Base articles from you. And... And you guys just started a base hang uh, YouTube channel, right? We did, yeah. Okay, so um, whoever One missed minute. the Slab Base Summit with Kevin Smith, Mike Bubb, uh, Ryan, Bo Sample, Nicolas de Boucher, um, I was there as well. And 
I think that we were we were the guys. Josh was there too, and yeah. uh, so so go to the to the base hang channel, Austin base hang channel, and check out the slab base summit. Um, thanks again, Ryan. Thanks for yeah. doing this. You know, it's been you know two hours flew by like this. Yeah, I did. Uh, really happy, and um, can't wait. To, you know, until all our gigs are restored so we can yeah. we can play again so i can come to austin and hang out with you and uh play your the highest uh action <laughs> base on the planet so i can get that real real pops foster pops foster tone tone can't wait to see you can't wait to yeah. hear you say hi to lauren will and do and Thank you to uh, everybody that came and hang, hung out with us here. Of course. I'll give uh, a little outro. All right. See you, Ryan. Everybody, thanks, for day. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for to everyone. I see you guys are all over the place. Serbia, of course. Uh, North Carolina, Los Angeles, uh, Russia, Spain. Argentina, Stockton, California, Mexico, Paris. Oh, man, I'm stoked. Chicago, Redondo Beach, my neighbors, Montreal, Canada. This is killer. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, please tune in next Saturday as well. Um, let me know. This is important. Let me know who would you like to see on future slap streams. So... I can get in touch with those guys and and ask them if they want to be part of it. Um, but write down that in the comments below the video. And in this section, right below the video, uh, after you subscribe here, 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 check out how you can support us. And I would like to keep this doing as long as possible. There's like so many great bass players that I want to feature. Um, and... Uh, so there's like a couple links for how you can donate and help me out with that. There's Venmo, there's PayPal, and there's Patreon. I just um, uploaded that, started that page, and I'll, I'll, I, I plan to work more on that. It's it's kind of like a cool tool. I was not sure about it. Like I've seen like other people, of mostly YouTubers doing it, and I was not that crazy about it but i think that i figured out the way the way i like it so that you can you guys can actually get something out of it so please check it out become a patreon if you if you like slab base if you like the stuff that i do um have i mentioned that you should subscribe here you should subscribe here and a few days ago i actually filmed another slab base sunday video so if you're not familiar with this go to my channel and go to the playlist, go to Slap Bass Sundays. And I think that I did like over 30 now. So binge watch all of them. Some of those are really cool. And even Slash commented on one of those. I did a cover of Sweet Child of Mine from Guns N' Roses and uh, Slash gave me thumbs up. I was, I was pretty stoked. This is outside of a Slap Bass world, but Slash is still one of the coolest rock and rollers out there. Um, so check that out. The new one is coming out. Uh, make sure to subscribe, donate if you can. And don't forget, never fret. Slide it in smooth and keep it in the groove. This is Georgia, your friendly neighborhood bullfiddle cat. See you next Saturday.